2007 at the Ritz Carlton in San Francisco. Um, it was a nice event. We had about 500 people came that time, including a young entrepreneur named Mark Cuban. I knew Mark Cuban before he was Mark Cuban. He was Mark. Uh, he, he had this crazy idea of what? Radio. He, he wanted, the way he made his company, Broadcast.com, happen, he, he thought that people from small towns and towns across America would want to hear the sports teams that from where they were from in the, in the city they're living. That was audio then. Great idea. I loved it. He didn't let me invest. Um, but he did sell that company, what, $4.6 billion to Yahoo a couple years later? But at the time I met him, he was just uh, not a struggling entrepreneur out of Dallas, but he certainly was just as festive and just as energetic and vibrant as anyone I've seen. Uh, and he shared his vision for the future of the time, as did much of others. Anyway, fast forward, something amazing happened. An industry was born. Uh, it turned out that Moist Silver IP was top secret technology out of the Israeli intelligence groups. It was actually invented by a general in 1980, and the 1980s Air Force pilots in Israel used it as a secret way to communicate with each other. And the reason why, and then, then after all those years, in the early 90s, the kids who went through the army in Israel started to commercialize it. And voice over IP was a core technology of Israeli intelligence and then became commercialized around the world. My conferences were very dependent upon uh, Israel about these people to come and to help make it all happen. And so Hebrew sort of became a second language in my conferences. I overheard it more in the men's room, but, but I always heard it. And it was just interesting just to see the dynamics of this. My business, within 18 months, I went from zero revenue to about $15 million. Uh, because you see, when you don't have any background in doing conferences, you can talk whatever you want. <laughs> now, now, the other nice thing about being an entrepreneur, about you know, not only being highly unemployable, is you get to create your own culture. And I don't know, those of you who've done startups, you know what I mean, is that you get to set your own rules. For me, I love music. I, I wish I could sing. Um, I really do wish I could sing. I can't sing. But uh, like in my office, when I had an office, I, uh, Friday between uh, Memorial Day weekend and Labor Day weekend, I, I installed a pizza karaoke Fridays, where people would uh, bring pizza in or whatever they wanted to eat, and two hours we had to karaoke. <laughs> like, like, not drunk, I mean like seriously, like this is work. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what was amazing was some people who were incredibly shy, by the end of that first summer, they found themselves, and they found a group. It was really nice to be around. And, uh, I also decided at that point to do a record label, so I started a record label and I brought an artist. So when we were taking a Friday off because we didn't want to sing for ourselves, whatever artist I was thinking about signing, I had them perform for us. And it was just really nice. It was very warm and very vibrant. And, and, and you're right, as an entrepreneur, you can do whatever you want to do. And so I was having the time of my life. I, uh, I don't know if you remember alternative rock bands from the 90s, but what I used to do, I saw the movie The Commitments um, in 91, and then I saw it a few times later. And, if you've ever seen the movie, uh, if you haven't seen the movie and you like music, watch it, download it, steal it, whatever. Uh, but it's about a bunch of kids in Ireland who get together to sing the music of Wilson Pickett. They believe that their calling is to sing soul music. And it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful movie. I actually, years later, ended up meeting the commitments and choosing a tour for them and become friends with them. And I even speak very good Irish to them. Um, I do. Um, but I won't let here. Uh, but, I, but I, what I did do, though, is whenever I had a conference, and you know, people are coming to do, if I made three million dollars at an event or four million dollars at an event, I took <coughs> hundreds of thousands of dollars and I hired a band to play for me. So whether it's Glory Wine, Wine, Smash Mouth, the, uh, the Commitments, uh, the County Crows, the Blue Dolls, Dewey Lewis, whoever it was, it was fair. And I put in the writer that Jeff was singing Must Take Salad. And I actually, so luckily for my friends, I actually stood away from the microphone and mouthed it, but it was. It was a lot of fun, and I, I just loved the energy of being able to just, just make fun happen. So I was having the time of my life. But what was crazy for me was um, in December 2000, I got a phone call from a competitor. And they asked me, uh, what am I selling the business? And I said, and they asked, what's your exit strategy? And I asked, what's an exit strategy? They <laughs> said, you know, when you sell your company and you uh, walk away and you do something else. And I said to myself, uh, Look, it's taken me my entire life to finally figure out what I'm good at, what I like. Why, why would I have an exit strategy? He says, well, because you should. And so, uh, and it's like I said, okay, this is a premonition. I, I just, I, I left it in the back of my head, and I figured, okay, maybe I should sell. I mean, I, I was, we were doing about anywhere from 12 to 15 million dollars in business. And I was going to mention I am a benevolent dictator. I, 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 uh, I come from a world of benevolent dictators. When you don't know anything about startups, you keep all the equity yourself. 
Um, I've since learned to share. But I, I, I was keeping everything to myself. And it was a very interesting life that I made. Um, and I, I paid people well, but I, I did not realize that I, had, I was supposed to share equity, so I made up for that later. But uh, also, while I was doing this, I had this crazy idea that one day there'll be a spot marketplace. Because back in the 90s, uh, B2B exchanges were very popular, some of them getting funded. So I created an exchange for to create a spot market for telecom. So working on Wall Street, we're making, we're, we created bonds, we created uh, options, we created equities. I figured that one day there'd be a market between trying to deliver both in New Orleans, Tokyo, or Tokyo someplace else, and people would bid on it. So I created a, B, a B2B exchange for that. And while I was doing that, uh, it turns out that uh, I hired a guy who um, took out all the profits totally in retail brokerage. His name was, he did a company called Daytech Online. His name is Jeffrey Citron. And I hired him to be CEO. And after I hired him to be CEO, I told I told about the next company I wanted to do, which was going to be a broadband telephone company. And uh, anyway, the minutes exchange ended up accidentally becoming Vonage. I don't know if any of you have heard of Vonage. Uh, I accidentally started the company. Uh, because of our stuff. Otherwise, forget it, right? It could not happen. Uh, but, but when it came time to sell this bond business, so it was kind of nuts. So I figured, okay, I have to sell. So uh, by July of 2001, I was having the best year ever because we were not subject to the dot com crash and the telecom crash. We were living in this world of communications and computing. But I found a buyer, and uh, it was very, not exactly, not a great conversation, but I found someone who set it up. Do you know the deal? The day the deal closed? The deal closed on September 10th, 2001. Now, I was in the destination events business. When people don't go on airplanes, guess what the value of my business would be worth the next day? Zero. Zero. Um, anyway, so the deal closed on September 10th, 2001. And uh, it, it, I can say that I, I mean, the value changed from paper. It was a company that started $15,000. On paper for one day, it was worth $57 million. For one day. Which is not a bad ROI, I guess, if you have to deal with that. Um, and again, I still do nothing about telecom, but that's a different story. Uh, and then 9 11 happens. Then I realized several things. Then I realized that I'm lucky to be alive, that being fired saved my life, that I was one person to die because when I hired a canner, I could steal them away. I did steal other people to do Minix, so I, 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 I still have a deal with a little partner. Um, and that um, being lucky is okay. Accept it. Own it. Don't defend it. It's okay to be lucky. You know, when you walk out the door right tomorrow morning, you walk out and you, you, if you don't walk out the door, you're going nowhere. And you can make a conscious decision to go in harm's way or luck's way. And if you allow yourself to go into the flow of what's happening around you, you allow the possibility for magic to happen. And magic can happen at any moment in time because what you say to someone can change their life. What you say to somebody else can change, they can change your life the same way. And maybe it's a, maybe it takes three years, maybe it takes two days, it doesn't matter. The, the fact that you're out there connecting changes everything. For me, um, so so I sold my business on September 10th. The money actually got paid on September 11th, which is crazy. Um, and then the value of the business started down to like $40 million because there was no upside. But the, the truth is my company is worth nothing. Because you know people were not getting on airplanes, so surprise, surprise, the company they sold my business to went bankrupt. Um, but I should tell you, my birthday was September, September 12th. So talk about three fucked up days of your life: I had September 10th, September 11th, and my birthday. And uh, I was stuck in Atlanta because that's where the event, that's where I closing was, and uh, I was there for a week. But um, it made me very grateful to be alive, and very grateful to be around to help other people. I decided that from that moment forward. That, 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 that if you see someone, you see an opportunity, you embrace it, you hug it, you own it, and you help. And uh, to this day, when I invest in startups, I look for people to believe in. And frankly, if you're, if you're looking to raise a million dollars and you're $10,000 away, and you're looking to raise $300,000 and no one's invested yet, I'd probably invest in you. Because I like to be the person to believe in someone else. Because if you already have the momentum, the drive, you don't need me. You know, I, 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 I invest in the energy of people I believe in. in all of, of a company, but I also believe in following yourself. I believe in connecting and feeling yourself. And you know, I um, I miss my dad greatly. Uh, my dad died in '98, and uh, he uh, you know he inspires me often. And I uh, he but the fighting I don't have anyone to really fight with, to fight with him. And I 
percent. Um, no, because he was right most of the time. In fact, when you grow up, you know, you don't realize that your parents are smarter than they seem until it's too late. Uh, and you also don't realize the last time you talked to somebody until it happened. Um, but then again, there's also people, if you are, anybody, anybody here an MBA student or any of you still in school? So the other, the other secret that you have been probably told is that you have to never do grow up. You are the person you are today. You will be for the next 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. You're you. You may look a little differently, but you're the same person. And you have feelings. The same issues you have, the same conflicts you have today, you're going to have in the future. It's just going to manifest itself a little differently. But you know, for me, um, I'm all about embracing startups. I'm all about you know, connecting and feeling and, and, and investing with my soul and feeling the flow of life around me and to, and to embrace it. And you know, there are no rules. The only rule is. Really, and I don't mean not to listen to people who are really good and really authoritative about certain things, but there are a lot of startups that I did that I was sort of successful in, and others that I didn't. And, and the mistake that I made sometimes is I let my friends at the time convince me not to do it. Because they didn't get me. I didn't, what I didn't realize, I didn't have the confidence to be myself. So I kind of outsourced that to someone else, and that failed. And you know, there, there's that moment in time in your life when you realize who you are or who, who you think you are. And that moment in time is never look back. You know, to look at failures all the time, because failures are awesome. Failure, you can learn so much more from failure than I can ever tell you about any success that I had. Because when I fail, I think I know why I failed. When I'm successful, I don't have a clue. I don't have any clue. I mean, no clue. It's, there's no roadmap. You know, when you're born, by the way, there's no, book, there's no manual to your life. I mean, it doesn't tell you to look at page 17, it's what you do. <laughs> So, so you have to follow it, you know, you have to follow it yourself. I crazy two, two crazy things. One is I went to Washington um, in, in, in February. I woke up with a premonition uh, in 2003 that if I didn't do something, the phone companies of America and the world would take control, take away innovative, innovation and communications. So I felt that I had to do something about it. Now, at this moment in time, I, I, did, I did start buying it. I had enemies in Washington. I did the voice on that coalition, so I had respect. But I decided to go to the FCC, and any, as any American citizen can do, and ask for clarity on one rule, that voice communication that starts on the broadband internet, that doesn't touch the legacy phone network, should not be regulated as telecom. Sounds simple to me. I'm not a lawyer. We drafted this uh, really nice document. It took five weeks. We filed it, and I was ready for a fight. I wanted to go and fight and stand my foot. Unfortunately, it turns out anyone can go to the FCC and file a petition. The FCC doesn't have to act on it. But uh, be careful what you wish for. Because 10 days after I filed, they put it out for public comment. What does that mean? That meant from March uh, to April 2003 was piss on Jeff Pulpermont. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I kid you not, it's so public, you can read it. Public companies from around the world, particularly in America, attacked my integrity. They attacked the merit of my uh, petition. And they attacked me. And it was fun for a little bit. <laughs> then I read it. And then I, then I had, the next month I could reply. And then they had like two sets of reply months. Well, in May of 2003, uh, the, the Department of Justice and the FBI went after me. And what I learned is you could fuck the phone companies. <laughs> but when the DOJ and FBI go after you, whoa! You see, they thought that my petition was, I was actually a, uh, how should I say, a, uh, agent against the state. They thought that I was trying to ban broadband wiretapping and that I was secretly harboring Al Qaeda. Oh, huh? So they accused me of, of, secret, of secretly harboring or having the aspiration to harbor Al -Qaeda, Al Qaeda communications on my network. So what do you do? You go to Washington. So I meet with the FBI and DOJ. <laughs> and uh, it's a very meeting. I don't know if any of you have ever seen Law Order, but I, I, feel, I have my team of uh, 10 people with us. We go to this uh, unmarked building in downtown Washington, and the second floor is at the Computer Crimes Division. We walk in, and there are three people there, but only one person can invite to introduce themselves. So we felt a little creepy. <laughs> and we look for cameras, like what's going on. And um, they start the meeting by saying that we're, uh, uh, we're, we're not here to argue the merits of your petition, but we have a few questions. So I brought my chief technology officer with me, and I felt bad because in about a half hour, we lost about 10 pounds of water weight. It was <laughs> So I jumped in. I said, guys, listen, if you think that we can help you find the bad guys, take my network. If you want to host us to do stuff, take it. Whatever you want. Whatever we can do to help you 
find what you're looking for, it's yours. <laughs> they look at each other like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> now, we do not hug it out, I promise you. But um, I made a couple friends. I, I hope that they hear this, they know we're still friends. Um, and and then, I, then, I, then, I, then I most surreal real thing, I went to the White House. I met uh, 2003, 2004, President Bush had a telephone czar. And uh, this was like a scene out of like the movies or something. It was like bizarre. So we, after dealing with the FBI DOJ in the morning, we, we meet in the West Wing of the White House in the afternoon. And we go in, and it was a two-story elevator. And we go to a guy's office with all glass walls. And he's, uh, he greets us, and he gives us all the signs of bullshit, you know, like President Bush is behind the dish, and it's going to grow up in America, blah, blah, blah. And we're looking at him, and we do our thing. But when we walk, and, we, and he says he supports us, blah, 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 we, we leave. As, as we leave, and he starts going to the elevator, he opened his doors and yelled at us, thank you for not asking for subsidies. And I was like, shit, we could have gotten subsidies. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, who knew, right? Anyway, nine months later, uh, in February 2004, Chairman Michael Powell issues, signs in a three and a half, one and a half ruling, signed the whole order to walk. And, and, I, and I learned that nothing is impossible. I learned that um, if, you have, if you don't know what you can do, you can do anything. It's only when you put boundaries in front of yourself that you get blocked. And uh, it's just really incredible. And I, it's probably one of my proudest achievements. Uh, Stanford Business School put out a, a case study about me. And sitting in the day, it was the day that the professors first introduced the whole board. It was very, one of the most frustrating days of my life because the professors told me for 60 minutes I had to sit on my hands. I couldn't say anything. Then I had 30 minutes to talk to the students who were much smarter than me and told me what they would have done given a similar situation. It was, it was a very nice thing. Um, Anyway, I can tell you more stuff if you want, but I, uh, it, it's, it's just, uh, for me, you know, being an entrepreneur is living and, and embracing who you are. Uh, I mean, one thing that I have been wanted for a very long time, if you don't know me, you may not know this, but my dad died at 62 of cancer. When he died, uh, he smoked a lot. My, my sisters, for years, always tried to get my dad to stop smoking. And, uh, but when he was, he, he died of lung cancer and brain cancer, and he, uh, at least the cigarettes that he, owned, that he smoked uh, said, warning you get cancer. Um, until very recently, I was eating uh, ignorantly. I, I, uh, I recently lost about 70 pounds. I hope to lose another 50. Um, I, since July 24th, I've been through this personal, I call it a personal reboot. Uh, it's in many ways uh, a, a reboot of my body. My triglycerides went from 265 down to 56 now. But I, I basically employed uh, doing, my, my life is just different because I I gave up eating wheat. I should say not wheat. I say gave, gave up eating wheat and uh, sugar. I, I, I do. Um, I eat lots of green stuff, fruits and vegetables. I exercise and I monitor my pH. And uh, and I, I started out uh, in July. You know, every day was painful for me. I my, my existence was painful. My best friends would both leave Advil and Tylenol because to walk 10 feet was hard. Just just hurt. And uh, my endurance went from about five minutes to now I can work out in hours. And uh, it's a much, much different life. And, uh, you know, I, I hope to be around longer than my dad and my kids. But I'll tell you, if you know anybody who, um, who you think might be interested in uh, losing or, you know, and it's not about weight loss, it's about body transformation. It's because I've never been stronger in my life and I've never felt as good. And it's, it's something which, uh, it's not about losing the weight, it's about getting yourself back. And just having the confidence to be you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very soulful, spiritual person. I don't really care what people look like. I feel them. Uh, but, but you know, to be able to take control of your life sometimes is not a bad thing. And I don't believe I'll go back. Uh, and I'm really happy about it. And I just, you know, friends of mine used to tell me, go to the gym, you'll feel good. I thought that I'd feel better on myself. What I realized is I'd be addicted to a drug called an orphan. <laughs> and that uh, you're in the, you know, all I have to do is work out. I feel better. And if you other things get too, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But just the ability to be addicted to something is awesome, and uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's legal, legal. And, uh, anyway, I just uh, wanted to put a plug in that if any of you ever thought about taking control of yourself, it's never too late, ever, ever. I mean, uh, I should tell you, if you don't know my age, you may not believe me, uh, so I will tell you, but, uh, uh, but it's in Wikipedia, so I, I, just, I turned 50 in September. I don't think I look 50. No. Uh, so I'm doing this at 50, which is a lot harder than doing it at 40 and doing it at 30. But I, I really don't think I'll ever look back. Um, and I'm proud of that. But I'm really, what I'm most proud about is that anyone can be with themselves at any time. 
and just listen to yourself. I, my biggest regrets really is, is not listening to myself sooner in life. As a kid, I didn't know what I couldn't do, so I did it. And then I got older and smarter and dumber. And then I let, learned to let go. And now I just live life. I, mean, I, I, I live and feel the stream of what's going on. And I just make stuff happen. And that I love. And uh, anyway, thank you for listening to me. I, I hope. Uh,